Well, thank you everyone for joining us for the Weatherhead uh, Center 2023 Book Blitz. Uh, it's tremendously excited. We are grateful to have eight Weatherhead faculty affiliates here with us to uh, present their recently published books. Uh, before I start, I just want to thank Michelle Nicolaisen, who's right there, who organized this whole thing. Thank you, Michelle. So this is, a, this is a very unusual format, I think, for academic presentations. We, ha we have eight presenters. We have an hour. And so each presenter has exactly seven minutes. And uh, that's a short time for academics, but we know they can all do it. Michelle is there with a the bell. She will ring the bell. I think there's a short ring for 30 seconds left, and then maybe a long ring for you got to get off the stage. <laughs> Um, and the order that we have decided on, I think it's not quite the order that they are arranged uh, here is uh, Frank uh, Dobbin will go first, Sarah Dryden Peterson, Carrie Elkins, Jeremy Friedman, Jennifer Leaning, Charlie Mayer, Sergi Plochi, and Dustin Tingley, uh, last but not least. And because it's rather tight here, um, I won't come up here to introduce each one of you. You can, when you come up, you just introduce yourself, what your name is your title or however you want to introduce yourself, and then your book, and then the seven minutes. Uh, oh, I should have said I can't introduce myself, for those of you who haven't met me. I'm Erez Manella. I'm the acting director of the Weatherhead Center uh, this year. Um, and with that, it's my pleasure to open uh, the book blitz. Uh, Frank, you're up first. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Erez, and thank you, Michelle, for organizing all this. Um, I'm Frank Dobbin. I'm a professor of sociology in the department across the hall, fifth and sixth floor. I'm currently chairing that department, so I have some experience with the management uh, troubles that I'll be talking about today. I, my book is called Getting to Diversity, What Works and What Doesn't. My co-author is Alexandra Kalev, who's uh, an associate professor of sociology at Tel Aviv University and chair of the department there. So we've been sharing our woes about diversity issues uh, in real life. Suddenly we are the kinds of managers that we are studying in the book. The book covers uh, 830 companies over 45 years. We, do, we have quantitative data for those companies over this period of time, and we also do a bunch of interviews, hundreds of interviews. So we have a lot of data, and our goal is to figure out what causes firms to become more diverse? What causes firms to become less diverse? And which diversity management programs do nothing at all? Many do nothing at all. The bad news is that the programs that are most likely to backfire, so by backfire, when I talk about success and failure, I'm talking about whether programs actually increase the diversity of the management population in firms. That's what we look at over time. With some statistical magic, we wipe everything else out of the equation. We just look at the effects of introducing a particular kind of diversity program. On the subsequent diversity, say seven, 10 years later, of managers. And the bad news is that the things that are most popular actually backfire. They actually lead to decreases in diversity. And what's particularly disturbing is that these are the things that companies have doubled down on since the murder of George Floyd in May of 2020. Companies got all excited about trying to fix this problem, and they're doing more of the stuff that backfires. The things that backfire won't be much of a surprise to social scientists, but I'll talk a minute about those and then two minutes maybe about what, <clears throat> what actually does work. The things that are most common these days and these have been things that have been common for 40 or 50 years, are anti-bias training of some sort, uh, rules to prevent managers from acting on biases, and grievance procedures to punish those managers who have been accused of and found guilty of uh, practicing discrimination in the workplace. None of these things work because they all are designed to change what goes on in people's heads or their behavior and they target individuals as the problem rather than social structures within the firm. And um, what they, they lead to a kind of backlash that uh, causes managers to shy away from issues of diversity, to not talk about them, 
and to actually be more likely to discriminate against uh, people of color and women. Um, so you have to read the book to learn why. Uh, less than $10 on Kindle. And um, so what, what actually works? The things that work are things that don't try to get in the, inside of the heads of individuals and don't identify individual managers as the culprit in the slow progress toward diversity. They're things that change the career system in sometimes subtle ways, but to open it up to wider ranges, wider, a wider range of groups of people. So we especially find that special recruitment systems, which are just a way of democratizing recruitment to include all people, are effective. The, the reason I say democratizing, firms have always recruited here at Harvard. Since the 20s, they've sent recruiters to Harvard. They don't go to Howard necessarily, and simply adding Howard to the list and other historically black colleges has a significant positive effect 10 years later on the diversity of managers. And it's a sustained effect that lasts in our data across the 40 years of data that we have. Um, another thing that works super well is mentoring programs that open up mentoring to everybody. So most companies, many companies still have mentoring programs that they describe as informal. And in informal mentoring programs, just as in informal recruitment programs, it's usually white male managers choosing their protégés, just as in informal recruitment, it's usually white men managers choosing the people they know in the community to hire. And they tend to choose people like themselves. It's kind of natural. Um, simply opening up the recruitment system, the mentoring system to everybody, so offering everybody in the firm a mentor, makes a huge effect that's also sustained over 40 years The data that, in the data that we see. The, the other things that um, are quite effective are democratizing skill and management training. So in most firms, skill and management training is kind of left to chance. A manager in a particular department accounting shows one of his subordinates, usually his, how to do payroll or how to do scheduling. And then when the manager is off for two weeks, that person takes over. And then suddenly when that manager gets promoted, the, the person who's been practicing being a manager um, gets the job. Just changing all of these processes so that they're open to everybody, democratized, the best way to do that with skill and management training is to let people nominate themselves for skill and management training and let anybody in the organization do it, not segment by where you are in the organization. The, and so the advantages of doing, chain, of doing diversity management in this way is it really opens up the um, career system to everybody. And I will just say one other, I think, important change com companies can make. Um, all kinds of work-life programs in increase opportunity for not only all groups of women, but all groups of minority men. Um, so it's actually pretty, pretty simple to implement policies that do make a change, but most companies are still doubling down on the policies that backfire. I have 10 seconds left. <laughs> Hello, it's great to be here. My name is Sarah Dryden Peterson, and I'm a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I'm going to begin with a question. And this question is, what would it take to ensure that all displaced young people would have access to learning that enables them to feel a sense of belonging and prepares them to build more peaceful and equitable futures? In Right Where We Belong, How Refugee Teachers and Students Are Changing the Future of Education, I show that where we are now in answering and acting on this question is both discouraging and hopeful. I present a story in the book that covers 15 years of ethnographic observations across 23 countries and more than 600 interviews. So what's discouraging? When I began my research in this field 15 years ago, the prevailing view was that education for refugees was a holding ground designed to create a more stable present, but to defer the creation of a future. <laughs> 
Most refugees had access to education only in separate schools for refugees, isolated from national education systems, and with the intention of providing temporary schooling with short-term goals. I was struck by how little this approach aligned with both the long-term nature of displacement, refugees are now typically displaced for between 10 and 20 years, and the kinds of education I observed refugee communities creating for their own children in terms of building connections to national education systems and, and, and connected also to the purposes um, aligned to the futures that they imagined. These local processes of reimagining refugee education as future-oriented really entered global policy in, in 2012 with a new and quite radical for a global approach of including refugees in national education systems. This movement to include refugees, which is where we are today, is hopeful in what it promises, but I argue that it remains discouraging in practice. It's discouraging in terms of access. Almost half of children globally who still don't have access to school live in conflict and displacement. It's also discouraging in terms of quality. Our work in Kenya shows that early grade literacy outcomes among refugees are among the lowest in the world. And it's discouraging in terms of opportunity. In almost all countries where refugees live, they are non-citizens, likely never citizens, and they have limited rights to movement, to work, to capital, and to long-term residence. Even in a best case scenario where refugee young people are able to access high quality education, the future opportunities they believe that education promises to them remain closed. Take Halwa, a 16 year old Syrian girl who arrived in Lebanon when she was nine. Departure from Syria came as a surprise to her and as she remembers it, one of the hardest moments was needing to leave behind her favorite teddy bear. In retrospect, she laughs at being worried about her toy, but her life in Syria at that time didn't force her to think about other things. In Syria, she watched a medical television show which inspired her goal to become a doctor. Her kindergarten teacher encouraged this idea and Kalwa remembers how she used to make me feel optimistic and say, you're going to become a doctor. You'll achieve your dreams. This dream remained with Kalwa. And at 16 years old, it had become a specific goal, many pages long in her notebook, of becoming a surgeon who helps people in need for free. After Googling the requirements for this training in Lebanon, she wrote out a detailed series of steps covering the next 12 years of her life by which she would accomplish this goal. But each step was also accompanied by a set of factors over which she had no control. Would refugees be allowed to continue to go to school in Lebanon? Would she be allowed to work in Lebanon if she did become a surgeon? She had top grades, the kind that according to the logics of exam systems would facilitate her further study and enable her to reach medical school. But what Kalwa heard from her teachers when she began primary school in Lebanon shook her trust in whether these opportunities would be open to her. She explained that she began to think, maybe they're right. Maybe we are coming to Lebanon. It's not our country. We can't study here. We can't work here. We can't stay here. Maybe they're right. We are occupying their country. Kalwa and other refugee young people know they're at the mercy of cyclical and conflicting logics, educational policies that allow them to study, but social and economic and migration policies and politics that do not allow them to participate. But I said where we are now in refugee education is both discouraging and hopeful. So what is hopeful? I find that refugee teachers and students can and are reimagining refugee education in ways that do meet long-term purposes focused on opportunity, like Khawa sought. Most importantly, they're doing this by finding ways to teach and learn that allow students to weave together their pasts, their presents, and their futures. Take Jacques. Jacques arrived as a refugee in Kampala, Uganda, without so much as a bunch of matoke, kind of banana, to feed his own family. But he dedicated himself to building a school. Jacques' idea of building a school was not so much to construct a physical structure, but rather to gather a core of teachers who would inspire learning. A school is not the building, it's the teacher, Jacques often says. He wrote down his goal for the school in red ink on a plain piece of white paper in a file that he carried with him everywhere. 
ensure for our children a basic education to prepare them for their future lives. Over the next 10 years, Jacques consistently demonstrated deep care for his students and acted unwaveringly to inspire their learning to prepare them for their future lives. For himself, Jacques' preferred future was to return home to Democratic Republic of Congo. In one's own village, that is where one really feels at home, he said. It is a place where the future can be imaginable. But in the context of ongoing war and no rule of law where you could be killed no matter when and no matter for what reason, any sort of predictable future of return is not imaginable. Jacques had come to the conclusion that home then is what he can build for himself, his students, and his children wherever they are. When you become a refugee, you must begin to live here, Jacques said, pointing to the ground beneath him, to emphasize that here is where one is from the moment of arrival. What I see in teachers like Jacques, and I hope we can all see, are ways to build the kinds of learning and belonging that can piece by piece enable more peaceful and equitable futures for all. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Make sure everybody's with us. What an honor and privilege to be here. I'm Caroline Elkins, and it's just, I look to my left and right, and. It's all our friends. I mean, it's just wonderful. And thank you so much, Weatherhead, for organizing this for us all. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this new doorstopper of a book, Legacy of Violence. Um, and I want to start by thinking about what's been happening in contemporary Britain. On the one hand, we have roads must fall. Churchill was a racist. The toppling of Colton into the River Avon. Windrush. Boris Johnson pushing an empire 2.0. Conservatives hitching the wagon of Brexit to a 21st century imperial resurgence. And they had a willing electorate. They still do. Recently, nearly 60% of Britons, <laughs> 90 to 60, um, when recently polled said empire was a force of good. Imperial history wars and their profound salience today. How did we get here? How do we in the present understand the past and the ways in which it shapes the world in which we're living today. To answer these questions, it's time to move our conversation beyond whether or not empire was a good thing or a bad thing, a force of evil or progress, to how and why coercion was a cornerstone of Britain's reformist agenda in the empire, its civilizing mission, its white man's burden. And that, I hope, is the journey that legacy of violence will take you on. It's a book that, for me, has been well over a decade, and that's, uh, that's an historian's decade, like 15 years, <laughs> in the making. And the idea for it came from my last book, Imperial Reckoning, which sought to establish as fact that Britain deployed systematic violence in Kenya's 1950s detention camps and then covered up its own incriminating evidence. The book then became the basis, for, uh, the evidentiary basis, for the first time the British government has been sued by a former colonized population in London's High Court. And in 2013, it resulted in an unprecedented settlement of 20 million pounds and an official apology from the British government to the Kenyan victims of British colonial rules. For me, though, questions remained. I dropped into this one moment in time in Kenya, and it was part of a much bigger story, a story where imperial agents circulated throughout the 19th and 20th century empire where coercion and reform rested uncomfortably with each other and were bound together by British liberal imperialism. This liberal imperialism was thought to be unique. Its civilizing mission would bring developmentalism with a heavy paternalistic hand to 700 million colonial subjects across a quarter of the world's landmass, the largest empire history has ever known. But liberal imperialism, with its coercion and its reform, was an oxymoron, a dualism that can only be explained if we keep coercion and reform in the same frame of historical analysis. If we ask how and why coercion and reform were two sides of empire's developmentalist coin. And so I set out to research and write a story of British empire through the lens of state-directed violence and the ways in which Britain's at home and in the empire, worked and reworked and understood 
colonial violence is part of the liberal imperial project. Put another way, violence, the law, and the state congeal during Britain's recurring crises of, of imperial legitimacy. And these crises often had dimensions beyond economic ones. And by moving away from arguments only about capitalism's sort of unremitting brutality, moving away from arguments squarely and solely in this context of, 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 of racial capitalism, and make no mistake, I still believe that that has a cornerstone, but we have to move ourselves from that. And when we do, I argue that violence was inherent to liberalism. It resided in liberalism's reformism, its claims to modernity, its promises of freedom, and its notion of the law exactly the opposite places where one normally associates violence. And the book's concern is therefore less with sort of prosaic forms of coercion, as insidious as they were, than with the so-called exceptional and dramatic moments of physical and epistemological violence that accompanied the legitimacy crises and require the replacement of ordinary laws and policing with martial or statutory martial law and the deployment of security forces. And such violence included things like corporal punishments, deportations, detention without trial, forced migrations, killing, sexual assaults, tortures, and accompanying phys uh, psychological terror, humiliation, and loss. And the book very much does not shy away from this. Because I'm, ex I'm seeking, as I said, to explain why and how Britain enacted these large-scale measures and the ways in which Britain understood, legitimated, and re-legitimated them over, several, uh, over almost two centuries. Now the result, it's a book that reveals the bureaucratic and legal machinery of oppression, something I call legalized lawlessness, or the process of making legal, otherwise illegal behavior, and therefore protecting British security forces from prosecution. The book also dissects liberal imperialism and really challenges recent historiographical and political defenses of British excep exceptionalism, exceptionalism and frankly just puncturing these myths of, of, of paternalism and progress and, and demonstrating liberal imperialism's perfidiousness um, across the empire. In the process of my research, which, as I said, um, spanned almost the lifetime of my children, they've been everywhere, where's Waldo on the map with my boys, um, but it also spanned 14 different research sites in a dozen different countries and, and in many ways generously funded. It wouldn't have happened without, without Weatherhead. And I expanded this temporal scope of my book um, in part to solve the problem of Britain's intentional acts of widespread document destruction and archival erasure. The extent of that became very apparent to us in the context of this High Court case uh, in London. Because initially the book was really to focus on post-World War II. I was going to have about a chapter or so of, of introduction of the pre-World War II period. Now the pre-World War II period is about um, half the book. And in part, it's because I had to move this in temporal time frame in order to sort of work around this problem of, 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 of sources or, or the knowledge that Britain had destroyed so many of them. And the book is bookended by two trials, the Warren Hastings trial um, in the late 19th century, then the Mau Mau trial, thank you, in the early 20th. And I really use this as a narrative device where we can sort of trace the evolution, the accretion of this long arc of what I call um, liberal imperialism, or sort of picking up on this notion of 19th century liberal imperialism and using it, as I say in the beginning of the introduction, which some purists, political scientists may feel is uh, anachronistic, but ultimately with the hope, as I said, to bring us to a different kind of place in our debate, away from good or bad, the balance sheet of violence, as opposed to how and why this happened across time and space. So thank you so much. Hi. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for inviting me. Um, I forgot to bring a copy of my book, but it's right over there, right for evolution on that table. You can take a look. Um, so I'm from Harvard Business School, and I'm here to talk about socialism, which is what you expect from Harvard Business School. Um, so socialism's gotten a lot more press in the last decade or so. Right? It's become a lot more prominent in American political discourse since Bernie Sanders runs for the presidency, since the squad in Congress. Um, you're probably familiar with polling, for example, that shows that now a majority of people age 18 to 34 have a more positive view of socialism than capitalism in the United States. But the question always is, okay, but what do they mean by socialism? And if you ask four people, you'll probably get six or seven different answers. So that's where the conversation ends, right? Because nobody knows what socialism means. So what I argue is we actually, we, we need to understand what socialism means by having a history of socialism, right? It's, what socialism would mean in practice is not simply you know, what an individual might theoretically want, but this is you know, a path-dependent product of history. 
And we understand this is the case of capitalism, right? History of capitalism is a rapidly growing field, very dynamic. There are conferences, there are journals, there are all numbers of job ads which talk about history of capitalism. And the central theme of history of capitalism is that the theory of capitalism and the practice of capitalism are different. In theory, capitalism is about efficient markets, price mechanisms, perfect information. In reality, right, as historians have told us, capitalism is often about violence and oppression and coercion and racism and imperialism, lots of things that get in the way of sort of, you know, price mechanisms and efficient markets. Um, but we haven't gotten there with socialism yet because people still hold on to the idea that real socialism has never been tried, which is an important political position, but it is not a historical claim. Um, and so we need a history of socialism as such, and that's what my book tries to get at. Uh, so my book concentrates on what was called during the Cold War the Third World. And the reason for this is that, you know, we have histories of the Soviet Union or histories of China, which focus very much on the domestic mechanism, domestic politics there. Um, we have, to a certain degree, histories of the left and the West, but those never really held power. Um, and so the Third World is really where kind of the dynamic movement happens during the Cold War. Um, and this is where I argue the Third World becomes a laboratory, a development, you know, an area of development for socialism, a place where experiments can be run, um, in which, you know, socialism evolves through a process of trial and error. It iterates over the course of the Cold War. And because it iterates, right, by the 1980s, 1990s, it's in a different place than it was in the 1940s. Um, and so this kind of iteration produces a socialism in the Cold War that is not what you might have thought of being in the Cold War. And to understand where socialism is today, you have to understand how it evolves, how it iterates in practice. So let me give you some examples of what this iteration might mean. Um, so examples from the book. Uh, so one question looking at the post-colonial world is, how do you build socialism in a country that has an agrarian economy? Right? There's no, very little industry, there's no working class, this is not what Marx envisioned. How do you build socialism in a country that has no working class and no factories to take over? Right? Very little in terms of means of production actually sees. So answer number one, early 1960s, West Africa, the Soviets tried, well, foreign aid, right? We'll pour in foreign aid, we'll do you know, geological surveys, we'll build the metallurgical factories, we'll build the dams, the infrastructure, create a working class, right? You can import industry, but you do it you know, through, from socialist countries owned by the state, and there you have state-led industrialization. Uh, this did not work very well for a number of reasons, one of them being that states began to worry about, you know, if you're president of a country and the Soviets are, you know, in force, um, trying to build a working class, you might wonder if they plan to keep you around for that long. Um, so they get thrown out of places like Ghana and Mali. Um, so along comes President Ureri in Tanzania and says, well, if foreign aid didn't work, self-reliance. Let's do it like this. We'll communalize our own agriculture. We'll use that to build an agricultural surplus, we'll sell the surplus abroad, use the money to industrialize, you know, sort of bootstrap our way to socialism through, you know, communalization. It turns out that's a very difficult and slow process, and if you don't have, you know, um, tractors and you can't afford them to begin with, you're not going to produce enough of a surplus to make this work. So you're sort of caught, you know, catch-22. How do you industrialize if you don't have industry already in order to produce the surplus? So what the Soviets do when that fails in Tanzania is they go to Angola in the late 1970s and say, you know what? Don't communalize your agriculture. And, you know, le in, how about you keep foreign direct investment? Um, and so they say, you know, we're not going to fund it, and you can't fund it by yourself. Let's have Western private companies fund the development that will lead to socialism. And so by the 1980s, you have Cuban guerrillas defending Gulf oil installations in Angola from American-armed United guerrillas, right? That's what you end up with all in the name of building socialism in Angola. And so markets become incorporated into socialism. Another example, right? In theory, Marx says that religion is the opiate of the masses. So how do you deal with, you know, the politics of a country where religion plays an important part? Where people are devoutly religious, where they saw religion as a form of oppression, you know, Christians trying to oppress Muslims in colonialism, um, and where, you know, imams still hold a lot of political power. So in Indonesia, they say, well, we'll try to enlighten, you know, the peasantry. Um, that didn't work very well. It ends up with the massacre of the Indonesian Communist Party. So they iterate, they, you know, reevaluate the role of religion, and then comes, you know, Iran in 1979, and the Soviet Union actually instructs the Iranian communists to support Ayatollah Khomeini coming to power and the idea that, no, he's a fellow revolutionary. This is also an anti-imperialist, anti-Western revolutionary. And so they helped Khomeini take power in 1979. Um, there's a lot more, if you want to know the details, read my book, uh, there's a lot more about this in there. But this is, you know, iterative process. So the end of the Cold War, you end up with a socialism that, number one, for example, embraces the notion of markets. That markets have a role in a socialist economy, as long as they're under state, you know, control. 
Um, but you're no longer looking at a centrally planned Stalin-style economy. We've evolved away from that. Um, notions of identity right, have moved beyond class. So people understand you know, that oppression can also be framed in terms of race or ethnicity or gender or religion. And these are meaningful narratives as far as you know, what a socialism might look like um, in the 21st century. Uh, so this is the, these are the kinds of ways in which socialism iterates, it evolves. And so when we think about what it means today, right, it has to be a product of the kinds of practices that socialism has you know, both uh, adopted and um, you know, rejected in the past. Uh, so I will cede my last 20 seconds to the chair. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Leaning. I am the Senior Research Associate at uh, the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. And I've done many other things in the past, but it will take too long to talk about it, except I want you to realize that this book was prompted because much of my avocational work and then my scholarly work has been involved in uh, observing, participating, and investigating issues of violations of human rights, medical care, um, the notion of autonomy, and the ways in which uh, populations caught up in war and conflict are crushed, just crushed, by those events. So that's what I've been studying and think about, thinking about and teaching about for a very long time. Um, this is, this is, I don't know, this, this is not an historian's decade. This is worse, okay? In 2000, I um, came out of a seminar at the uh, Harvard Center for Population and Development Studies and talked to the then acting director because there had been mention of um, the partition of India. And I, and with some of the issues that are attached to that. <clears throat> and I came out and I said to him, uh, a very renowned economist from Oxford, I said, Sudhir, how many people actually were killed or died during the partition of British India, 1947? And uh, he's very, you know, deep, knowledgeable economist, which means he knows a lot of history, and uh, trained in the British tradition, so he does. And uh, he said, let me check. And he came back to me a couple of days and said, I don't think anybody really knows. So this is 2000. And uh, I said, well, that's unbelievable. Let's figure this out. So I got a number of colleagues of mine, and they got some colleagues, biostatisticians, demographers, you know, people who know about documents. Um, none of them really know, knew about the partition of British India. But um, the demographer I, I enlisted, a very fine professor called Ken Hill, he said, well, let's start to see what the census documents show. And lo and behold, and they're here in Widener, there are a, from the early, late 1880s, all the way up through the present, and I hope beyond, are every 10 years, the censuses of what was British India back in the 1880s, and after partition, marvelously, because things were extraordinarily bitter after the partition of British India in 1947, the two chief um, officers for the commission of the census in both Pakistan and India met and agreed they would keep the same dates, the same protocols, and that they would add, this is it, in the 1951 census of British India, where were you, all you hundreds of millions, that still at that time they were counting by individuals uh, where were you in 1947? That was the only question that was added. And Ken and colleagues basically did sort of artificial um, estimates and re-estimates based on sequential study of the um, census. Um, how many people were missing from 1947 to 1951? And what they actually came up with what they actually came up with was something that is, um, that's pretty extraordinary. 15 to 18 million people cross the Punjab border alone, one way or the other, because we decided to focus on the Punjab. Partition in the eastern part of India is much more complicated and long-lasting, not in terms of memory, but in terms of process. 15 to 18 million people in those years cross the border one way or the other, 
from what is now Pakistani Punjab into Indian Punjab and back the other way. And approximately two to three million people died, meaning they were missing from the 1951 census. So we did extensive analysis, in and out migration, Indian deaths during the World War II, et cetera, and these numbers held strong. So then, for my background as a humanitarian um, analyst, I said that is still, and it still is, it was there in 2000 or 2008 when our paper in Pop Studies came out, it's still the largest instance of forced migration in a humanitarian crisis ever seen in the world. And those numbers, those numbers who died when we established that there was no other place they could have bled out of the partition, bled out of the subcontinent, those numbers who died were actually far too great from just looking at who dies in forced migration than you see in the forced migrations then, 2000, 2008, 2015, even now, 2023. There was something edgy about that number who died. So then I began to explore what actually happened in 1947 partition. And I realized I needed to get a team of people together, which would include some demographers, but also a number of people from the subcontinent, because I do not come from the subcontinent. And to begin to burrow into their libraries and their consciousness and their sense of history, I would need to have people who are historians or um, artists or storytellers or demographers from the subcontinent. So the Weatherhead Center basically um, gave me a very good lead in terms of support to do that. And then after years of work, because it wasn't that this was a first full-time occupation, and then um, I uh, beseeched the Mittal Institute, the South Asia Institute, then the Mittal Institute, to help me further. So with funding that was um, relatively robust, I was able to bring together scholars from India, some scholars from the United States, and come up with this book, The 1947 Partition of British India, subtitled Forced Migration and Its Reverberations. So um, let me give you a couple of insights, okay? If you think about the Partition of India, it's been studied a lot by historians, demographers, sociologists, etc. cetera. Um, but the, the general narrative is at the high level of state politics, Nehru and Jinnah and the Brits. Um, there are some, in, in, particularly in more current times, deeper studies, ethnographic studies, what happened to women. There's some marvelous studies coming out now about partition. Um, but none have focused on this humanitarian mm. question. Who died? How? Where? And what happened? And so this involved looking at the various uh, newspapers in India and, and, and uh, Pakistan that were focusing on the Punjab. There's some very good ones. It involved all sorts of archives in, in India and in the um, British Library. And what we came out with was a story of privation, fear, um, long-lived loss, and the point that these people were not just forced across a border between Lahore and Amritsar. They fled and they died. And the killing happened not just in those choke points, but it happened in the countryside. Very, very large number of micro massacres. And so part of what the survivors of partition have to deal with and their descendants is this deep animus and sense of grievance that was not just a political decision that was made by the superpowers, but was what was carried out by the other side, okay, the religious other side that um, is now still something under great investigation. Thank you. Need all my seven minutes, but we'll see. Thank you to the to the Weatherhead Center, and thank you all for coming. By this time, you must be a little dizzied by the one book after another. Uh, so I'm, I thought I would read a bit from my preface to introduce introduce my book. Uh, 
and uh, at one point I'll amplify. It's called The Project State and Its Rivals, A New History of the 20th and 21st Century. Uh, there's another subtitle I thought of, which is Reframing 20th Century History. Uh, in any case, it's my eighth book. It took a lot of effort, but it built on, I think, really 50 years of reading. Uh, this work arose as an effort to make sense of the political and economic transformations of our time. Uh, this obviously can be a treacherous ambition. The historian's present is always changing, and at times drastically. I was born a half year before World War II began in Europe. As a young but politically aware observer, I lived through episodes of the Cold War, then 40 years later witnessed what seemed to be a sudden and surprising conclusion. Leaving aside the digital re re revolution or the changes in medical science that have transformed all our lives, my adult lifetime has seen the vigorous post-war recovery of Germany and Japan, what I believe was the peak of US economic and international primacy, and the legal, if not socioeconomic, dismantling of its racial hierarchies. In recent decades, the stupendous rise of Chinese national power, and even as I sent this manuscript to press uh, in my own 80s, the Russian effort to reconstitute the imperial hold it formerly exercised in Eastern Europe. This book, however, focuses on developments that do not always spring to mind as constitutive of our times. I believe nation and, and territory and cultural specificities provide important coordinates for structuring historical narrative, but this book does not emphasize those markers. It is not a narrative text as such. And it is not a general survey of world history, nor a history of the nation state system and its conflicts, nor a history of celebrated and infamous leaders, important though they have been. It bypasses the military history of the great wars, the genocides, and the development of regimes that brought early death to perhaps 200 million people of the 11 billion or so who have lived during part or all of the 20th century. Instead, I try here to illuminate other conflicts and forces that have successfully, successively, successfully shaped or perhaps more pro precisely allowed the evolving political outcomes of the 20th century and the first quarter of the 21st. And to this end, I propose collective protagonists that are different from the heroes and the villains many histories follow. I focus first on project states, both democratic and totalitarian. A project state, uh, by project state I mean a political unit that has an ambitious agenda for transforming political institutions, civil society, and even mentalities. Many states are project states for a brief period of their time. I think of the New Deal, the Third Reich, the British labor government, uh, uh, aspects of the Russian Revolution and the Chinese, two Chinese revolutions, one of 1911 and, uh, and one of 1949. Uh, I don't claim expertise in these areas, and I touch down on different ones at different points. This book depends a lot on young researchers, my own graduate students and many others. Uh, Isaac Newton said, we see fur I see further because I stand on the shoulders of giants. What I've seen I st is because I've stood on the shoulders of my graduate students, so to speak. So I examine project states, resource empires, that is the interwar empires that were largely devoted not to more expansion, but to taking resources from the uh, colonies and sending them back uh, to, uh, to, to the metropoles. Uh, they lasted formally until the 1960s, but they bequeathed international legacies of racial and economic inequality that still remain powerful. Third, the book discusses the transition, transnational domains of capital and of the organizations, and fourth, of the organizations supposedly devoted to disinterested, what I call, governance. Uh, I have a specific uh, usage of that that I explained by governance. I mean the effort to, through science or discussion, 
or not through politics to arrive at solutions for human problems, uh, foundations, NGOs, the UN, to a degree, the European Union. These are all governance institutions. They play a role as one of my, uh, as one of my major actors. Uh, my account of the last hundred years, some years, thus seeks to follow the evolution and changing weight of these collective agencies, sometimes working against each other, sometimes braided together and working in tandem. Now, this does not mean that our older historical categories, such as democracies and dictatorships, inv are invalid or obsolete. This is hardly the case. But reframing long-term categories of historical analysis, such as I've attempted here, can provide a more comprehensive sense of the changes underway for a century or more. I felt challenged at the outset, I have to confess, by Montesquieu, who argued in the mid-18th century that the laws, by which he also meant institutions, had to be consistent with each other, that one ch when one changed, all must change, and that the, uh, as if history were some giant spreadsheet, and my horizontal variables were these, were these categories of project, state, governance, resource, empire, and, and such, and I uh, had to be consistent with each other, and that when one changed, all must change, and that their underlying relationship was what he called the spirit of the laws. So I've tried here to account today for our new spirit of the laws, which I don't find a very cheerful one, but uh, I, I hope, uh, I urge you, you know, it'd be nice to have you read this book. Uh, it's costly. Eventually, it'll be less costly. It's, uh, uh, it's not quite. It'll be out for sale in April. But I think you will get a perspective of the world that you don't have from most of our histories. Thank you. OK. Hello. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thanks for coming here. Uh, I am Sudhi Ploki. I am professor in the Department of History and director of the Ukrainian Research Institute that's over there. The title of the book is Atoms and Ashes, A Global History of Nuclear Disasters. And the first question that I will try to answer is how one ends up writing histories of nuclear disasters. Um, before this book, I wrote a book on, the, on Chernobyl. 1986. That was very much a personal story. I come from Ukraine. Mm, I, I am a historian of Ukraine and Soviet Union. And I wrote a book that was received mm, quite well. And then uh, the reaction that I got was uh, on, on a number of, number of kinds, mostly positive, uh, very positive. But there were also questions uh, of the sort that, well, it's it's wonderful that you did that and that you described how the Soviet Union was involved in cover-up and so on and so forth. But do you really think that our governments here in the West actually behave differently or would behave differently? And I paused. I didn't know the answer. Another question was, uh, okay, it looks like you are uh, really arguing against the use of nuclear energy. Or by pointing finger at the Soviet government and the way how it mishandled the whole thing, you're really trying to say that the nuclear industry here in the West is fine and okay. And I, I actually, I didn't know what to say to that because that was not the set of questions that I dealt with as a, as a historian of the Soviet Union or as someone who was in, in, affected by, by the Chernobyl disaster. And I decided to write a new book and answer those questions for myself and for for others as well. And that's, that's the atoms and ashes, that's where that book came from. I um, <clears throat> focused on six largest nuclear disasters, um, and there are six chapters in the book, each of them. One uh, is dedicated to the um, Castle Bravo, the first test of the, hydro uh, of the um, hydrogen bomb that went, went um, too well it, 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 the, the yield was two and a half times what they expected. The, there was an enormous um, um, nuclear, nuclear fallout, contamination. The, the, uh, 
local population of the, of the Pacific Islands was affected. They evacuated it and so on and so forth. Then in 1957, um, a spent fuel tank exploded in the Ural Mountains in the Soviet Union, the so-called Kishtim disaster. A few weeks later, the wind scale fire in the United Kingdom. In 1979, the Three Mile Island here in the United States, 86 Chernobyl, and 2011 Fukushima. Uh, with uh, five out of six disasters, it was very easy for me to choose them because I just looked at the, at the uh, table of the worst nuclear disasters, and they were right there. So my innovation was to bring in the 1954 uh, 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 Castle Bravo disaster because normally it's not listed there because it's considered to be a purely military. But for me, that was an important way actually to talk about uh, all these nuclear disasters as one way or another related to the military stage of the development of nuclear industry as a whole. Uh, today, there are 400 plus minus reactors out there in the world. None of them was created specifically to boil water. All of them are some form of, uh, um, um, in, in one way or another, they follow the basic design that was developed for the, for the military purposes, either for a production of the enriched uranium and plutonium or for the, for the uh, power in uh, nuclear submarines. And this military origins of, of, of the nuclear industry, it's really, it's really with us today. And on that level, all six disasters, they, are, they have the footprint of the military, military origins and productions. The distinction between atoms for peace and atoms for war is really created back in the 1950s with the main goal of sell to the American public the idea of, of building more atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs to, to show that the atoms actually can produce and can do good things as well. They not, only, they not only cause destruction. And that military origins, it, it uh, really manifests itself in the, in the uh, nuclear industry afterwards. Uh, first of all, it's a culture of secrecy. Uh, um, what I discovered that really the instincts of the governments, the instincts of the people involved in that, uh, corporations and so on and so forth, is one and the same, irrespective whether it's Japan, whether it's UK, United States, or the Soviet Union. So no one wants to actually deliver bad news. And the, the cover-up is, for a number of reasons, political, economic, and other reasons, that's, that is what is happening. And that was helped also by the origins of the industry in the, mili in the military. The um, Three Mile Island, there is also the case that the operators trained in the American Navy actually are trained to run small reactors and react to the, any problems with the big reactor, the way how they would re react to the problems at the, at the mm, submarine, and so on and so forth. So despite the fact that there is a lot in common in the way how we as societies, as institutions, react to the nuclear disasters anywhere in the world, there are also clear, clear differences as well. And one thing that I, I sort of uh, knew even before writing this book, but what I really confirmed, that the Soviets were able to get away with the murder when it comes to the cover-up. The full control of the media, the full control of the, of the information space, of course, is the uh, reason why the Kishtim disaster, one of the um, most deadly disasters on this, on this scale, one of the five top disasters, we didn't know about it until, until uh, late 1980s. So 30 or 35 years, it was completely hidden from the society. Now to the question of what, what do I think about as a result of doing this research, what I think about the future of the nuclear, of the nuclear industry. Well, one thing is that I am absolutely sure that there will be accidents in the future. Each new accident, there is a learning curve, but each new accident actually comes from the, from the area, from the place from which we didn't expect it to come. Uh, the, this book that you see there, it's a paperback. It has a new edition and new conclusion, and addition and conclusion is about uh, or, or parts added to the introduction is about the war in Ukraine 
hitting the nuclear sites, including the largest in Europe, something that I didn't expect, no one expects to happen when I send this book to printers for the, for the hardcover. Thank you for your attention. Hi, everyone. I'm Dustin Tingley. I'm a professor in the government department, and I'm also the chair of a research cluster here in the Weatherhead Center that's designed to get more young social scientists studying the topic of climate change. Um, so the book that I'm uh, presenting about uh, Uncertain Futures, How to Lock the Climate Impasse, is joint with Alex Gazmararian, who's actually a PhD student uh, down at Princeton. Um, there's been a lot of history today, so I'm not a historian, but there's one chapter that has a fair bit of history in it, and so I'm going to start out and tell you a little story about that. So in the, uh, uh, 1990, uh, the U.S. government passed amendments to the Clean Air Act. This was to combat acid rain. Some of you remember that? Okay. So this was tremendously successful legislation from an environmental perspective. Okay. It basically um, targeted high sulfur coal, and high sulfur coal was creating acid rain. Now, high sulfur coal was also the type of coal that was produced in Appalachia. So think West Virginia, parts of Ohio, Pennsylvania, et cetera. So uh, Robert Byrd, uh, the senator of uh, West Virginia, comes along and says, you know what we need? We need to get a lot of money to help these workers transition and these communities transition out of coal um, and into other things. And so he came up with the Byrd Amendment. And the Byrd Amendment ended up being one of the most divisive uh, air, uh, 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 spectacles of that Senate's time. Okay? Um, and it was ferocious. People on all sides of it, you know, for or against. Um, it went down. Um, it was opposed. It was about, you know, close to a billion dollars. Um, and it lost 50, uh, 49 to 50, okay? Um, who cast the deciding vote against the Byrd Amendment? No other than Joe Biden. Byrd then takes the parchment paper of that vote and pins it to the Appropriation Committee wall because he chaired the Appropriation Committee and wanted to remind everyone who walked into that room in the future never to cross him again. This is a book about the uncertain futures of the clean energy transition. It is very easy to tell a story about the clean energy transition, that all of these green jobs are going to materialize, that we're going to have lots of uh, opportunities um, for economic development, and that communities that have been powering our existence are going to be swept up in this optimism. But what this book does, it goes and it talks to those communities, it listens to those communities, and it documents the challenges that they see in this transition. So we did things like run surveys at country fairs in Appalachia, interview economic development officials in Carbon County out at West, talk to people in state government, in local government, about the challenges they see. And here are two big challenges they, they see. The first is something that we as social scientists call a credibility problem, but what these folks talk about using their own vernacular. And here's the scenario. These are long-term transitions. So if I'm coming to you and saying, hey, I'm going to help this community transition to a whole new economy, and I'm coming in, and here's some money now, the question they ask is, well, is that going to be coming in the future, or is this just some sort of one-off thing? Because they've lived this before, OK? That's what we call a credibility problem because the government cannot credibly commit to a long-term investment. Why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. One, you could have a new government in the future. We have something called democratic turnover in countries like ours. Or the priorities of a given administration could change over time. So fundamentally, these types of policies that seek to make investments in an area face a credibility problem. And what the book does is it come along, comes along and says, well, here's a menu of things that you could design regulation and legislation in ways that help to alleviate that credi credibility problem. And in doing so, you actually increase the support for the clean energy transition in these areas by making these policies credible. The second thing that these communities will say is, look, where are the local economic benefits to this clean energy transition. Because you know what? I can point to a mine, I can point to an oil well, and I can document, I can trace about how the proceeds of that help to fund our football stadium, or our library, or our roads. 
So where are the local economic benefits in this clean energy transition? And it turns out it's a little tricky. So for example, once you install a field of solar panels, what does, what does maintenance look like? A weed whacker and Windex. We were interviewing some union officials who represented people both in renewable sectors and the fossil sector, and I'm like, geez, I just don't understand. Why exactly is it that so many more people are employed in a coal-fired power plant? And the response was, you silly Harvard professor, it's precisely because it's dirty. It's precisely because it is dirty, it requires a lot of maintenance, right? So where are the local economic, economic benefits going to be? Now, it turns out there, are, there could be tremendous opportunities, but you have to think through these nuances. So for example, I'm a big fan of geothermal power. Why? Because pipe fitter and boilermaker unions love it. <laughs> and because pipe fitter and boilermaker unions love it, and it will be sustained employment, okay? So we've got to think about these things, because this is going to be a long haul transition. This is not going to be a two years and we're done transition. This is going to be a long haul transition. I'll end with an example that comes from Minnesota, and it gives you a flavor of how we might make progress addressing those concerns about local economic benefits. So um, Minnesota, um, uh, one of the unions over there, they were facing lots of opposition about installing wind turbines, right? And wind turbines are pretty good too because they require some maintenance. And uh, the problem was all, of their, all the people, um, they were saying, look, when I go to where they're installing wind turbines and I look at the license plates on the trucks of who is installing the wind turbines, what do I see? I don't see Minnesota license plates. I see license plates from Texas or Oklahoma. Where are the local jobs? So what they and the Public Utility Commission did is that they simply mandated for these projects that you had to transparently report the number of jobs going to the locals. And in doing so, it unlocked substantial support for the clean energy transition because the local community could say, no, we're actually part of this, rather than it being opposed from us uh, on FAR. Thank you. <laughs>